Under torture, an 18th century Hungarian witch confessed to having fought a battle against the Turks and Germans in the sky and for the empire alongside her troops after they had been given wings like a bird by God. Her name was Erzsébet Bata. Though not much is known about her childhood and youth, it can be said that in her prime she had the reputation of a revered healer, who by means of witchcraft and magic treated epilepsy, paralysis, heart pains, colic, stomach and eye disorders, impotence and barrenness. Not merely that, but she was also supposedly a Tautosh, a shaman of Hungarian tradition who could access hidden truths and predict the future, transform into animals, and fly in spirit form across large distances to battlefields as an agent of divine intervention. During her witch trial, which spanned over a year in Debrecen, between 1725 and 1726, Erzsébet denied having made a pact with the devil and maintained that her supernatural abilities were divine given to her by God while she was still inside her mother's womb, for these were abilities of which she was proud. After all, she did not only use them to fight enemy troops, but also to defeat maleficent witches who targeted and bewitched the local gentry. My name is Laura, and you are watching The Paranormal Scholar. Before we cut into this case too deeply, if you will allow, I'd like to take a brief moment to thank the sponsor of this video, Kamikoto Knives. Used by Michelin star chefs all over the world, Kamikoto knives are made of high quality Japanese steel, with each blade crafted using traditional techniques that have been honed and perfected by generations of knife smiths. By going through a rigorous 19 step process that takes several years to complete, each knife is hardy and precise, with Kamikoto's Japanese steel having been sharpened to bear an excruciatingly fine edge. When I first received these knives, I was immediately impressed by their presentation, with Kamikoto's knife sets coming in a beautiful, heavy-duty ash wood box, making it a great gift. But above all, I was impressed by the knives themselves, and how they effortlessly dissected foodstuffs that I would normally struggle to cut. Given that each knife is individually inspected and comes with a lifetime guarantee, performance quality is at the steely core of these timeless blades. Kamikoto's Black Friday sale is now on, and not only that, if you use my discount code Paranormal Scholar, they'll give you an extra $50 off on any purchase, all on top of their special offers. Simply go to kamikoto.com forward slash Paranormal Scholar to get your knives set and help support my channel. Thank you. Now on with the video. Erzsébet was but one out of 37 known individuals who were named as Taltosh in the judicial files of the 17th and 18th century witch trials in eastern Hungary at the Transylvanian border. At the time, the Taltosh of Hungary and the corresponding students of the mythical Skolomans or cloud banishers in Transylvania were brought to trial alongside village witches, not for their indigenous beliefs, folk practices, and shamanistic traditions, but rather for their supposed practice of witchcraft and dark magic. After all, according to some historians, the string of accusations of witchcraft in the region started to spread when the local gentry experienced a shift in mentality, away from the healers of the old and towards the institutionalised framework of urban healthcare that was being gradually reinforced by authorities. As, although many traditional specialists of positive magic, such as barbers, midwives and healing witches, wavered to the new norm, steadily entering the sphere of what was now considered legitimate practice, some remained loyal to the old ways. Erzsébet was said to have been among those who stood by such outmoded practices thus becoming a threat to the representatives of what was now determined the only way to provide legitimate health care. And what made her all the more threatening were her supposed supernatural powers. 
As a Tautosh, Erdebet was no mere witch. While, according to folk tradition, a witch learns her craft and powers from the devil, the Tautosh is said to be chosen by the gods or spirits at birth, meaning they are endowed with supernatural abilities that can rarely be matched by a witch. Such abilities might consist of entering deep trances to access hidden truths, communicating with the spirit world and metamorphosis, all of which Erzhebet was deemed to have been capable of according to her neighbours. Above all, it was her alleged ability to access hidden truths and see the future that put her most at odds with her contemporaries, for certainly it was claimed that she predicted a fire that came upon the city, and that she could also tell the outcome of an illness or the possible death of a patient. This placed her not merely outside the bounds of legitimate practice, but also beyond those of other healers or witches. She had not necessarily learned a craft, but instead drew from her innate Tautosh abilities in order to provide healing. In short, Erzhebet's methods were utterly unacceptable. Such meant that, when she found herself in the sphere of illegitimate practice, she became vulnerable to her envious rivals, and, so we are told, their attacks in spirit form. A healer woman by the name of Mrs. Maroshi, who lived on the same street as Erzhebet, is said to have been one such rival. The woman, who entered into conflict with Erzhebet after healing the same patient, testified against her neighbour at her trial in 1725. Two years prior, so the healer woman claimed, she had treated one of Erzhebet's patients, thus disrupting her work with them. When they ran into each other afterwards, Erzhebet accused Mrs. Maroshi of having meddled with her work, belittled her powers, and warned her that she would come to regret undermining her authority. The very next day, according to the testimony of Mrs. Maroshi, Erzhebet sent crows to her, who pecked her bread and cheese, and after she ate it, she became ill. Soon, more accusations of witchcraft followed. A husband and wife who were displeased with Erzhebet's practice, and who were known to have brought accusations of witchcraft against other healers before, claimed that Erzhebet refused to continue treating them, because she somehow found out that they sought the services of another healer in secret. The other healer, described as a fair-haired, fat, red woman in green coat, green bonnet, and blue skirt, lived just across the street from them. Unlike her rivals, Erzhebet would not meddle in another's work, and so refused to treat those who had already been treated by another. She did, however, warn the couple. Beware of her, she supposedly said, because on the third day, if she can take something from your house or from your merchandise, she will take it. But don't give anything to her, because if she is able to take something, no one will be ever able to heal you. The wife related to the court in the most vivid terms how the suspicion Erzhebet had planted in her grew to fill her soul. According to her testimony, she sat next to her few goods for sale in the market when the fair-haired healer came straight up to her and stopped in front of her stand to request a piece of linen for a shirt. Remembering Erzhebet's warning, the wife was horrified and immediately refused to sell anything to the fair-haired healer. Supposedly, the woman stood there for a while with the merchandise, then left all of a sudden without saying a word to anyone, thus confirming the suspicions of the wife. The fair-haired healer surely must have been harmful. And although she had Erzhebet to thank for her warning, the wife proceeded to testify against her anyway. She claimed that Erzhebet was offended because while she was still her patient, she went to see a barber in Transylvania. Her husband, likewise, accused Erzhebet of being quick to anger after they sought out yet another healer. Sensationally, he even went on to describe how, one time around midnight, he felt an agonizing pain and found himself struggling with a woman who twisted his manhood really badly. He was convinced that the night-stalking, manhood-molesting woman was Erzhebet. 
And so it was, paradoxically, that Ergebet was deemed a powerful witch, able to control crows and apparate at night, but also an incapable healer who was so incompetent that she could only be jealous of other healers and vengeful of the patients who sought them out. In reality, we can speculate that her warning against other healers was born from her frustration at her patients wandering, constantly disrupting prescriptions before they could yield results, and thus compromise her methods. Although her success at healing was controversial, what everyone seemed to agree upon was that Ergebet had indeed been an expert on bewitchment who diagnosed every illness as maleficum or harmful sorcery. Documents from her trial describe how she often extracted bindings from the wounds of the suffering, and how it was that she found the bewitching substances laid in the path of the patient. In this way, part of her healing method was to identify the bewitcher and subsequently offer advice and protection against their future attempts at causing harm. Not merely this, whilst most healers at the time offered ointment, medicine or a special diet as cautionary measures, Ergebet offered cautions in the form of startling predictions. According to the surviving records, one witness told the court that, after requesting help for his wife whose health was in a dire condition, Ergebet warned him, don't mourn your wife because she will get better, you just have to go home, but you must get there while the sun is still in the sky. As for the bewitcher, she was described as the woman dressed in black. She would, so she predicted, come to the man and ask whether his poor wife was getting any better or not presumably an attempt to further bewitch the woman. For certainly, several other witness testimonies described how the bewitchers whose work Ergebet sought to undo would meddle with her healing rituals in spirit form or by sending their familiar spirits to attack her. On more than one occasion, it was claimed that Ergebet was interrupted by such adversary spirits while healing her patients with those present claiming to have witnessed a series of strange occurrences. One patient told the tribunal that, as she was massaging ointment under him, suddenly a rattle and clatter was heard in the room, and the door was kicked so hard that the bolt of the lock fell off. Thereafter, Ergebet started to sweat heavily and collapsed, losing consciousness for a short while. When she came back to her senses, she continued healing the patient. On other occasions, patients and their companions present at the healing sessions claimed to have witnessed objects being smashed by unseen hands onto the floor with great clatter and rattle. Birds chillingly chirping at night, dogs barking aggressively and breaking the silence of the night, bumblebees materialising in the room, and other sensational and atypical occurrences. All as Ergebet applied her treatments, especially her ointments. Many believe those events to have been the attacks of maleficent witches who were angry at Ergebet for undoing their bewitchment of the patient, or who were jealous of her practice. Horrifically, Ergebet was not the only target of the alleged attacks. Her patients are said to have likewise suffered, if not during the healing rituals, then later in the night. In particular, men often complained that they would wake in agony as the bewitcher twisted their manhood, causing them to suffer from itching in the groin area thereafter. And as odd and unbelievable as this may seem, it was very much believed at the time, with Ergebet herself having claimed to have fought back against the Maleficent witches in what has been described as nighttime spirit battles, battles which often resulted in injury. Such was alleged by a patient who constantly walks between her and another healer. He testified that Ergebet fought over him at night with the other healer, and that the next day she had showed him how her skin was badly scratched, sliced and cut. According to his testimony, Ergebet told him that all of this happened last night because of you. Had I known this would happen, I wouldn't have stepped a foot in your house, even if you paid me 100 forints. And so it was, or at least so it seemed, attacks in spirit form were normal practice for Ergebet and her rivals. So normal, indeed, that there were even accusations that Ergebet herself, despite being a known fighter of bewitchers, sometimes found herself on the bewitching side of the craft, 
with witnesses accusing her of threatening them with nighttime spirit attacks in order to make them pay for further treatment fees or to punish them for unpaid services. In this way, the detailed documentation of her case offers a unique insight into the rich world typically inherent in early modern village witchcraft. Her supposed practices and the accusations against her were not at all unusual in the 18th century. In many witch trials, testimonies of nighttime spirit attacks and battles between patient and witch, healer and bewitcher, or between rival healers were commonplace. Even then, although Erzsébet could be considered a standard bewitchment healing anti-witch, whose spirit battles were otherwise considered ordinary witch battles, her claim that she was a Tartosh, a shaman born with innate spiritually gifted powers, sets her case apart. Not merely that, it was claimed that she was aided in her battles by her Tartosh relatives and friends. In one case, it was claimed that she was assisted in a battle against several bewitchers by her very own 12-year-old daughter, whom she had described as being a Tantosh prior to the tribunal, and who was mentioned by several witnesses. According to one witness who testified about the young girl's abilities to the tribunal, many individuals fought a battle with Mrs. Barta last night, but the most powerful of them all was the young daughter of Mrs. Barta, who took the sword in her mouth and fought terribly. Allegedly lying in bed, watching as it happened, the witness claimed that Erzsébet had reassured them by saying, don't be afraid, no one will hurt you. The witness also supposedly heard Erzsébet say that if it hadn't been for her daughter, the bewitchers would have killed her in that battle. Another witness told the tribunal that Erzsébet was fearful of the attacks, and that if her brother had still been alive, he would have protected her from them, for there was no greater Taltosh in the country than him. The witness also supposedly asked Erzsébet where she learned to be a Taltosh, to which she replied, God had created her that way. And indeed, in her confession under torture, she claimed the same, that her Taltosh knowledge and powers had been taught by God, and that God had formed her into a Taltosh in the womb of her mother. Throughout, Erzsébet denied any association with the devil, claiming to have never formed a pact with him. She did, however, speak candidly about being a Taltosh, mentioning the Taltosh nature of her brother and daughter as positive features. Her gifts, then, were blessings, ones which she was able to use as a healer of bewitchment. She, as such, at least during the trial, considered her Taltosh talents to be the opposite of witchcraft, with her emphasising how witches were the enemies of the Taltosh. Such, according to historians, was also the reoccurring stereotypical statement of other Tautosh appearing before the courts of Debrecen and its vicinity. Even so, in spite of this consensus of belief, the tribunal at the time saw the witch Tautosh opposition emphasised by Erzsébet as a clever marketing trick, with them declaring that she only pretended that witches were her enemies so that her patients sought her help, believing that she was a woman taught by God. In this way, the tribunal decided her guilt and condemned her for witchcraft. Then, terribly, they continued to interrogate and torture her so as to learn more about her Teltosh activities. It is then that she confessed that she fought in the sky against Turks and Germans for the Empire. Other than that, Erzsébet would say no more about her Teltosh activities or companions than she already had. And so, she remained trapped within the dire circumstances of rivalry among healers, wandering patients and their tragedies, neighbourly animosities, and breaking the norm of the God-fearing woman. She was further charged with treasure-seeing, divination, and identifying bewitchment. The tribunal considered her healings as acts of diabolical profession, that is, witchcraft, and her fortune-telling was declared diabolical divination. She was, therefore, sentenced to exile, and was banned from the city of Debrecen and its vicinity, never to emerge in known historical records again. But the Tautosh would return again in the case of Ilona Borshi, from Teglid, whose trial was conducted between 1730 and 1736. In her voluntary testimony, she declared that she lived from quackery, that is, from healing with herbs. 
She confessed that the reason she was not living with her husband was that she must stay away from men so that her skill does not become ineffective. She said that she got her knowledge in her mother's womb and that she was a semi tantosh because she was born with a molar tooth on her left side. It is from Ilona that we learn the difference between being a Taltosh like Erzsebet claimed to be, and a semi-Taltosh like her. The Taltosh, above all, do battle for their respective regions of the country, and the semi-Taltosh practice only healing, but they do not bewitch anybody, though they recognize witches and know about their deeds. Ilona also told the tribunal about a single combat between a female and a male Taltosh to which she was taken at the age of seven. They took her flying on their horses so that she could watch the fight. According to her account, she saw them fighting in the sky as a vision inside a vision. Fantastically, she alleged that the couple took her on their horses, which flew up into the sky when they left the city, and thus they arrived at a hill two miles outside of another city, where the Taltosh gather three times a year, in the months of the Pentecost, St. James and St. Michael. Here they tied the horses to a thick tree, and she was placed on the ground. Then the two Taltosh undressed completely and went down to the valley, where they turned into bulls and were engaged in combat for hours. Meanwhile, the female bull saw that Ilona wanted to watch them, so she ran to her and encouraged her not to be afraid. Then she ran back and locked horns again, and then they flew up in the air and continued the unavailing battle and butting for about an hour and a half. In the meantime, one of the tethered Taltosh horses said to Ilona, Don't be afraid of what you see in the sky. Just go to sleep. No one will hurt you. After they descended from above and regained their human form, it is said that they asked Ilona if she saw anything in the sky, to which she replied that she had seen lightning, but that she had not been afraid because she was also encouraged by the horse. She equally claimed that she saw that the male Tautosh injured the woman on the left side of her chest, and the woman said that this had happened on several occasions before and that she would heal herself. Then they ate from the bread and drank from the water that they had brought along with them. After this, we are told via her testimony that she was put on a horse to see if she could ride a Tautosh horse alone, but since she was weak, she cried, and they let her off the horse and took her flying with them. The event described by Ilona appears as some manner of initiation into the Tautosh tradition. After all, although said to have been born with supernatural powers, the Tautosh and corresponding magical children found in neighbouring cultures traditionally undergo an initiation led by the elders around the age of seven. Some folklore tells us even continues studying the mysterious shamanic tradition at the Transylvanian Skolomance, or the Black School, also mentioned in Serbo-Croatian folklore, a place where they supposedly learn how to master the ether, communicate with animals and the spirit world, and use their abilities to heal the community, protect it against maleficent witches, and ensure a good harvest. And yet, for all the good these shamanesque healers and innately magical individuals were claimed to do, starting in the 18th century the population turned its back on them, thus rejecting what had up until that point been the norms relating to them. Erzsebet and Ilona were outside of legitimate society. Their old way practices were not acceptable according to the Christianizing and demonologist attitude of the court deny as they might, their initiations were deemed pacts with the devil, and their reunions became the witches' sabbath, when they gathered for worship of Satan. In many ways, it can be said that people forgot their heritage. The supernatural, the strange and inexplicable, if not church-sanctioned, was relegated to the embarrassing and not to be engaged with sidelines. Anything other than doctrine was, after all, devilry. Such a view might have had an impact on Erzsebet's claims that God made her the way she was. And yet, far from it being a clever marketing trick condemned by the tribunal, Erzsebet's attitude appears instead to have been one of sincere surety, that her work and values were aligned with what was good and divine in her heart, showing that the only true evil lurking in the community was that which nestled in the hearts of those who sought to harm their neighbours. 
Thank you so much for watching, and thank you to my dear friend Radiana for once again researching and writing for my channel. We both truly hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, you might like to watch another suggested on screen now, or equally sign up to my email newsletter over on paranormalscholar.com so as to receive notifications of all new content straight to your inbox. Until next time, 